So a very, very warm welcome. And I was just saying, if you were here earlier in the UK, it's an extremely warm welcome um, to uh, to this afternoon here uh, in the UK. Uh, I've just seen my son go off for uh, a dog walk, his, his once a day piece with, uh, with shorts on uh, in March. It's glorious here. So a really warm welcome. Um, and I'm also joined by Jeannie, um, who's going to take herself off mute and give us her very uh, warm welcome all the way from New York. So welcome, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Uh, and Lauren is also joining us on the Q&A. So Lauren, do you want to just say hi, pop yourself off your camera, let people see your lovely face? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the um, today's webinar. If you have any questions throughout the session, I'm on hand and ready to help you all. Brilliant. Um, so um, Lauren um, absolutely loves Q&A, so please do keep her busy. Um, let her earn her, her, uh, her place in that sun in that garden this afternoon. So please uh, just, just come up with the questions um, and we'll try and answer those as quick as we can this afternoon. So, um, so introducing the career guide, a warm welcome, helping people find their perfect job. So Jeannie and I will co-host this. And what we really want to, get, to cover with you today um, is why we why we've put this together. So most of you, I can see really familiar names here. We'll be using Strengths Profile, um, and and thinking about then you know what were the next steps and the reasons behind why we've done this. Um, we're going to be introducing the actual product, what that looks like. And again, I've seen some names in there, uh, and um, I know some of you are using it already. Maybe some of you have used it with your uh, children, uh, and uh, just sort of thinking about you know, what those next steps on how you might access the product as well. Um, my best bit is the science. Um, I'm going to tell you how I got those extra white hairs over the summer last year and going through all of that data. Uh, and of course, really importantly, how we actually apply this new product and how to have those strengths-based conversations. Uh, and right at the end, I'm going to do some teasers around data. Uh, we've got a lot more data to share with you, um, but um, it's really important that you can kind of see some of that data that was coming through. Uh, we have an abundance to be able to share with you over the course of the year. Uh, and we're going to start off with teasing you a little bit around students and uh, sector strengths. So you're in for a great half an hour uh, and, of course, Q&A along the way. So in terms of ten, uh, strengths profile, it's nearly just over 10 years old now, um, and it's been going great. Uh, we've been using it really successfully uh, with most of you on the call, uh, with coaches, with educators, uh, with organisations. We were noticing a really steady shift uh, upwards with the educator market. People really starting to think about strengths-based uh, development with their students. Um, and that's because the strengths-based recruitment work is now sort of nearly 50%. Um, some form of strengths-based recruitment is um, being applied in about 50% of organisations. So really important that then the students are then starting to come through and think about their strengths development, why they're with your, yourselves as educators. Um, but of, So that was our starting point. And then how do you scale that as well? So conversations with students are great on that one-to-one hour in workshops, um, maybe in internet sites, you know, how do we think about scaling that and giving students that value add? So that was our starting point. But then we thought, why stop there? This could be something that organisations could use. Apprentices, apprenticeships and internships could get real value for managers, could have career focused conversations. Imagine that, you know, something that we can really think about the focus and development of future of the people that we lead. So. These are the reasons that we were really thinking about that we could add value. And of course, we've been doing this for, for over 10 years. So the data was there for us. Um, as always, the foundation to the career guide has been our profile. So the performance, energy and use. If you're new to strengths profile, uh, performance, energy and use is the foundation of which it is built. Uh, from, from there, you have the realised, unrealised strengths, learned behaviours and weaknesses. So it's so important that you go through the model just as you always do with your clients, building that self-awareness of their key realised and unrealised strengths, uh, the things that might drain them, and then moving on, of course, into the career guide. So you're always going to start with that foundation. That's why it sits towards the back of the profile as well, so that it doesn't, so that you're not tempted just to kind of, uh, all the students or uh, people in organisations tempted just to go there and think about their career. It's a process, and that process, of course, starts with understanding our realised and unrealised strengths and what makes us tick. So the product itself then, um, in summary, we've taken the top six sectors 
uh, within our bank of 43 that we've come up with and more around the science shortly. Um, and we've given um, your, your, your people who take your, your clients uh, the top six recommended sectors based on their strengths. And it's the amount, in summary, it's the amount of strengths, um, the number of strengths that most match. So you're accounting the strength here. You might find here maybe have seven, seven or eight matches towards their, their realised strengths. So it's the number of strengths that match the sectors the most. And I will come on to that in a little bit more around um, how we got to that. Um, most of us using Strengths Profile, we love and realise strengths, that, that real talent, that potential, that future, that excitement, that buzz. Um, as I've watched thousands of you coach, um, you come up with some great things like light at the end of a rainbow, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and all sorts of great ways to describe them. But the potential So it also looks at two job areas uh, that we could recommend based on unrealised strengths as well. Um, so whoever you are, you're thinking about today and what I am doing and doing really well. But, you know, maybe this is your, your three to five year plan here. Um, so some key product features um, available within the both introductory and expert. And it's really important to recognize in the introductory profile, we do actually take the expert data when we're looking at the career guide. So as an example, um, You'll only ever see those seven realised strengths because the profile itself has not changed at all. Um, but it has taken eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 realised strength in the back end to produce the career guide. Um, it shouldn't reveal uh, anything too untoward or anything too unusual uh, for, the, for your clients because, of course, these are their strengths. So an example might be teaching has come up. Uh, and if you just looked at their top seven, um, you might not see that spotlight or narrator or the strengths that we've mapped towards that, but they are there uh, and that'll make sense to the individual, of course, because that they'll recognise that potentially in themselves. Um, it's uh, So we've talked about the six sectors for realise and unrealised. Now, it is only based on strengths. We do not look at learned behaviours and weaknesses when we've come into this. Um, and we wanted it to be uh, careers that strengthen people. Um, and also because, as you all know, learn behaviours can change over time. Things that drain us, um, it's, it's, we can overcome because we can use our strengths. Um, and sometimes you can get context-driven weaknesses as well. So these are strengths-based um, sector mappings. Um, and coming on to those sectors, then there are 43. And when we go on to the science, that will make a bit more sense. Uh, but there's 43 different map sectors and you can get access to all 43 of those within our FAQ site. It gives you what all 43. Three are and, and their definitions. Another key part is it's alphabetical. It's, there is no ranking. So, of course, you'll have gone through the realised strengths first and they're ranked, as you know. When you come on to the career side, it, they're not mapped. Uh, they're not ranked, sorry. And that is because we want you to have conversation rather than kind of look at it in order and think, well, accounting's five rather than six. Or does that mean I should be doing consulting versus banking? Um, it's a conversation. So, you know, all six probably in terms of their score, you know, maybe not that the differentiation between the different um, all six maybe wasn't huge. So do bear that in mind that it, it's not ranked. Um, those of you that have been using SP for a while, um, it's opt-in. So you'll be used to grabbing your codes or inviting people on your dashboards. Um, you have to select this as an additional option um, in terms of a toggle. It's really easy to do. But don't worry for those of you that potentially thought, think, well, what if I don't want to use it? You do have to opt in to use it. Um, and on that note, um, it is free. You don't have to pay anything more. It's just opt in and it gets included in your profile. Um, and again, for those that have been using us uh, for a little while, um, you can unlock people from um, previous groups, people that already sit in your dashboard. The only caveat I would just add to that is it might be a little bit odd potentially if um, someone uh, you've just unlocked somebody's profile, you've not spoken to them for a year, they'll get an email that says, hey, you've got a career guide that's been unlocked. Um, you know, what does that mean for the individual? Who's following that up? Is a conversation going to happen? So people get notified um, if, if you unlock them. So do bear that in mind. But all of this and more, the FAQ side of things available um, on our website with screenshots and all sorts. So do make use of that. Again, I'm hoping that you're keeping Lauren busy with Q&A uh, along the way. Um, 
So coming on to the science then, I never thought I would enjoy ranking and weighting and algorithms so much as I did last year. And I genuinely mean that because what we were finding was just the living and breathing of the strengths data. So it was it was brilliant. Um, how we got to that then? So we looked at 60,000 strengths profiles across uh, 85 countries, uh, a, gen a, a split between the genders, of course, um, uh, minimum age is 16. Um, there is no upward age. Um, those of you that know me well will know that my 12-year-old or my 15-year-old have been using Strengths Profile for years. But um, it's, um, uh, in fact, I did the career guide with my 12-year-old and uh, it was brilliant because at 12, who's got a clue? And I could see her doing all of these things, but that's my lack of adherence, I'm afraid. Um so we, I defined the sectors according to the mapping. And what that means is there's no list of 43 that you'll find on another website somewhere. Um, they, were, they were the sectors that were right for um, our demographics that we had in the back end and also how the science worked. So an example of that is I had IT. Um, IT, as I started to map IT, and I come on to how I did that, um, software development and all sorts of different IT roles came into that. And I soon realized software development was very different from IT. So, um, you know, I manage a team of software developers, heavy on the incubator, heavy on creativity, uh, innovation being high for them. Um, so, you know, some real sort of key strengths that were coming through for that group, whereas the IT, um, typically sort of service IT, service, action, prevention, very different strengths that were coming through. So, the, the, the sectors became um, the final sectors based on where my mapping took took me. It wasn't just me doing it, of course, but I did start the mapping um, and I used my 10 years or so experience of strengths. I used to work in the recruitment space as well. Um, and, um, and first of all, just blitz it. And then we, I had a, a, a brilliant time just like <gasps> just starting from a blank sheet of paper. Um, Lauren then supported me on some blind mapping and then we got to an agreement um, about where the next stage to take us to the third mapping stage here. So, um, and again, I'm going to share some of this data with you towards the end. We then looked at the prominent sector strengths within Strengths Profile. So what we know um, is that, you know, 60,000, we know what a typical quadrant looks like, the most frequent strengths, learned behaviours and real strengths and weaknesses coming through. Um, so we looked at that and we looked at the differences that were coming through for people in those sectors. You're very kind as you complete strengths profile, you fill in your demographics for us. So we know what kinds of roles that you're in. So we then compared that with the norm data uh, and there were some real spikes uh, coming through. So we, and we started to look at where those spikes were uh, and how big those spikes were coming through with the, the sectors and how they differentiated with that norm data. Um, and then in terms of the mapping, the final piece was the, uh, we've got a, a section within the demographics about how engaged you were at work. So we took those highly engaged folk and we mapped those again onto the science, onto the data that we had and said, okay, what do we now know that's even more different? Where are there even more spikes? Who do we need to, you know, what strengths need to go up and down? So lots going on there in terms of the mapping. Um, and um, that then took us to, of course, test profiles. And I can see some people in the audience that have helped us do that testing. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I then, after some testing, um, we were doing some amendments to ranking and weighting. So an example would be if you've got moral compass at number one in your realized strengths, um, that gave it a slightly higher ranking. Also, if I've matched that higher for banking um, than maybe the 12th one that I've mapped for banking, that also made it slightly higher. So. Some amendments around ranking and weighting. They even built me a system so I could do it myself because they were so fed up with me going, oh, can we just take number 43 up three spaces and see what that does to the weighting? Um, and we did face validity as well. This was like going around, of course, uh, and sharing with people the, the sectors that we had come up with for them and getting their, their feedback on that. So I hope at this point um, you've, um, you've got some Q&A for, uh, for, for Lauren around the science. Um, please do you know, keep sharing um, anything, any feedback that you've got around that. But I hope that makes sense. Uh, and, and I guess why we want to share that in so much detail with you is you need to have confidence um, that you're going out there with a product that really works. So in terms of the application, I've got a couple more slides and then I'm going to hand over to the lovely Jeannie to share her experience from her NYU days. We're very lucky to have hands-on educator experience. 
So I put together a career guide model, which the next slide builds on a little bit more. But here's kind of this, whether you're in an organisation, whether you're a coach, whether you're a manager, uh, whether you're building your people uh, or strengthening your students, it's kind of like a wheel that which we recommend how to have those conversations. So starting with reactions and going down to next steps. So it's it's a guide to have there. And again, you will absolutely have these slides to share afterwards with the recording. So um, and there's quite a bit on this slide. Um, but I wanted to bring out the questions that may be really relevant for you, whoever you're working with. Again, this these career conversations are relevant for, for everyone, no matter what sector you work in and what role that you have. We're all looking to have a great job, progress in our careers and enjoy what we do. Um, so the reactions, just like Strength's profile, once you've gone through the self-awareness piece and the model and the coaching, you're going to get those reactions around people's uh, first impressions of the, uh, the sectors that have been shared. Um, and also kind of you know, thinking about what, what perhaps didn't share, what's a never. So I've had a couple of clients that have said to me, um, you know, whilst these three I, I really understand and are absolutely me, banking, no way, just never banking. I don't want to be there. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. It's not like the strengths profile where you expect it to match 100% someone's really intrinsic motivation. Um, but what you can confidently say is, that's great, put a line through it. But what you do know is that if ever you did go into banking, you've got the strengths to make that work. Um, so you're going, of course, with your, your coachy uh, or your, your direct report in terms of, of what, what's right for them and their motivation. In terms of reality, you're just going to be checking in, I guess, around how focused they are right now, maybe how focused they are. Uh, if somebody doesn't have much focus as a student, you're going to be starting from scratch a bit, of course. Um, if if they are a little bit more focused, really seeing what that reality is. So um, an example here was my son is um, is uh, 80 and um, he's one of those unfortunate people that have the A-levels uh, taken away at the last minute. Um, but he wants to do his business degree and he um, is very hell-bent business, business all the way, really good at business. That's what he's doing his A-level is in. But when we did the career guy sector, what came out for him was some slightly... Um, uh, I dare say softer, but slightly more people orientated sector. So he had um, he had social care, he had uh, non profit, he had HR, he had people management that came out for him. Um, so when he saw that, he was a little bit disappointed. But we had this great conversation around. Okay, so whilst when you finish your business degree, um, he kind of knew that he didn't want to go into anything too maybe cutthroat business, but maybe something that was more involved around people. Uh, maybe making something around more around making a difference in the workplace, helping people, HR, non-profit, or maybe the type of sector that he wanted to work in within business. So it's a conversation starter. That's how we would look at this. So really helping people start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, career goals can be quite difficult for, for um, younger people, but you know the first year goal might be, um, I'd like a job in finance. The five-year goal might be, I really want to be a leader working abroad. Uh, and globally, um, but what do the sectors matching saying around some of these maybe more concrete or vague goals? Um, you know, thinking about transferable skills, it's really important to think about. Okay, so I'm in marketing, but I might want if sales has come up for me. Um, so, or I've got some marketing experience. So I'm doing a marketing degree, but um, or a marketing role, but sales is here. So, how can that person start to feed in more things around sales, just to build their CV up, build the experience of it if they did want to go into something else later on? Again, those transferable skills have been have been worked on. So, yes, the, these these conversations are really starting to sow the seed. They might not be right for your student or your direct report today. But six months time, but when we were doing the face validity, people were saying, oh, you know, 20 years ago, my school report said all these things. So you're sowing the seed. Um, we, a little bit around that example, I guess, around my son here, around the, the combining of sectors, but really thinking about, you know, the sectors in isolation, but also how, you know, somebody else said to me, oh, I've done five of these roles already in my career to date. So that kind of makes sense for me. So where am I focusing on now? What should I really enjoy before? How can I do more of that going forward? And of course, next steps as well. You know, how does all of that conversation materialise into, of course, the most important action plan? What do I need to do to further my career in some of these areas? Um, so I can see the Q&A buzzing, which is great. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a moment. 
Um, so now I'm going to pass on to Jeannie, who's going to share a little bit more around uh, the practical application uh, within the education space. So over to you, Jeannie. Thanks, Judy. Um, so just sort of diving right, right in, um, you know, I've been part of Capfinity now for, I'm going to celebrate about a month. Um, and prior to that, I spent the last 15 years in higher education, um, in career development. And I would say over the, the course of my career, it's always been working very closely with employers, both locally in New York, uh, as well as the United States, and also on a, a global scale. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen sort of, and I feel like for many of you that are in this space, um, is, you know, students are asking for direction and they want to be told what to do. And obviously we know in our roles in career development, it's giving them the sort of insights um, and the opportunity to, to, to think about their own self as it relates to the market and what they're looking to do. But what I loved about when I was at NYU as an assistant dean in career development, the fact that this really focused on their energy. And it, you know, when, when we look at what's happening in the world today, um, and obviously this was pre all that's going on now, um, we knew that people were going to be working way longer in their careers. So you know, when we see the length of a career, it's not we're working until we're 60 or 70, but our careers are going to span about, about 70 years. And then we also look, looked at you know, people are changing jobs every four and a half years. I think that that number is actually smaller. I think it's closer to three now. Um, and skills are becoming outdated much faster. And so as we thought about our role within, within the school, and within the university, it was how are we setting up our students for success? Because we know that they're going to be facing a life of change. And you know, and being able to use a tool like Strengths Profile, where they're actually able to understand strengths as it relates to their energy, was really important. And so, as we looked at, as a center, we were in the School of Professional Studies, and we had a career wellness model where it was moving away from this reactive state of I'm going to engage with with the services that my university offers to a more proactive approach. And it was really helpful where we you know, really looked at how do we overlap strengths into all that we do and, and making sure that it wasn't just a one-off thing that we were offering to our student body and to our faculty and to our alumni and stakeholders. It was really important that this was up embedded into what we do as a, as a department, but also as a school in ways that we were partnering with all of our various stakeholders. And so this is just an, a brief overview of the toolkit where when you, when you think about the career development process from a more self-assessment st standpoint, it's helping candidates understand more about them, themselves and digging deeper into the why. Um, one of the challenges that I've seen in my, in my various roles in higher education is that it's really easy for people to do their research about what a role could look like, but it's a lot harder for, for people to do that more internal work from, from scratch. And so being able to have a tool that gives them a sense of a point in time based on their sort of energy performance and use what are some of the things that gave them energy and set them up for success? Um, we found that that was, was, was extremely helpful. And so even as you go through that career development process, right from a self-assessment of what's important, you're looking at how are they exploring their strengths and strength spotting to the market assessment part of the process of what are the different types of roles and functions that a student may be exploring. Um, and again, we were, my last role within the School of Professional Studies, we were very focused on sort of industries and functions. But even within that, it was really helpful to even give students career anchors. So even though they, they may have been studying global affairs in peacemaking, what were some of the actual functional areas that would be helpful? 
and as we moved along to more of the career prep, right? This is the area that, or I should say strengthening CVs and, and interviews. We found that so many students enjoyed, or actually not enjoyed, but um, they were more familiar with the, with those uh, parts of the process of diving right in and trying to create a resume and, and cover letter when, when in fact it was that pre-work that was really important. Um, and so again, this is all to say that as we looked at incorporating a strength-based approach into the work, it was, it was, a, it was sort of an add-on that was woven through all that we did and it helped sort of build a strong foundation that lives on beyond a person. Um, Cause we know that we're, you know, in career services where we're tasked, we're doing a lot of things. And once a person moves on, so sometimes some of the things goes with them. And so it's really thinking about how we are creating a scalable model that serves obviously the individual unique need of our stakeholders, but then it's also, um, it can continue on. And so this was a, just a very brief overview as we thought about how do we implement this into the experience um, of, of of the campus. Um, it, it was thinking about from, from a workshop perspective, how do we actually build and create awareness around the language of strengths? Um, that was also important. And we also found that we were getting a lot of requests for uh, just community building um, around pro professional and careers. We were finding that um, people were asking for more uh, for an ability to engage with peers across programs and across the the university whether it was virtual or in person obviously this we focused mostly on on virtual um, and so it, the workshop goals externally were very simple it was just building awareness a shared language and community um, the the internal goals obviously it was sort of embedding that that strengths based approach to the work within career development um, and obviously building that that shared language um, and I know for in the United States you know student success is definitely sort of the buzzword of 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 the time now and really thinking about what does student success means from the lens of career development and it and it was moving to a, um, a shared model of bringing people together as they're navigating through their sort of career path. Um, and so when we thought about what are some of the goals of these workshops, whether it was, you know, bringing them together or post, um, and it was really important that we thought about how do we deliver the model of strengths profile to a large audience, but then creating sort of, you know, whether we call them co cohorts or group coaching so that the magic happens in those conversations with each other. And when I say magic, it really was, you know, I think of a couple of our student groups where we have students from all different disciplines and, and even levels, undergrad, graduates, um, and sectors all across different areas where they were supporting and providing um, just feedback to each other and building relationships. And obviously in this time, it is really important that we're creating some kind of community for our students where they're able to come together. And the groups would meet every six, four to six weeks um, and, the range, and the groups ranged in size, but you really saw how the coach was sort of navigating the conversation, but they were also overlaying their understanding of their own strengths to what they were dealing with, whether it was from resilience to working through a challenge. Um, it was really, it was powerful. And so as you think about scaling, how do you deliver that initial debrief in, to a large audience? You're going through the science and, and what the model looks like and then breaking off into smaller groups where it's not just the one-on-one -on -one coaching, but it's group coaching together. Um, and as we thought about sort of the staff size, you, similar to, to today where you have your moderators and then you have someone on support who's, who's able to 
to answer questions and move people through the actual um, web webinar. And so that is all from my end. Um, I'm happy to actually answer any questions as they come, come through or afterwards, um, but I turn it over back to you, Trudy. Brilliant. Awesome. Thank you, Jeannie. So some real hands-on experience of using um, SP at NYU. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so just bringing that onto organisations, and I'm aware we've only just got a few minutes left, but um, I didn't want to, anyone from an organisation, absolutely, a career conversation is really important. And how we've already found this being used in organisations um, is a, a is around that sort of talent mapping the future, managers having great conversations or not being scared to have career conversations because they've got tools uh, and conversations that are at the ready. Um, of course, things like, you know, making sure that people are in their right roles when you're doing covers. Um, also just healthy career conversations. Um, you know, one of our um, career clients is Burberry, very much using um, Strengths Profile to just help everybody find the right role uh, within a large organisation and enjoy what they do. Um, so um, some, some ways in which organisations are starting to use the approach. Remember, you can opt in or out. So um, organisations, it's it's something that you might choose to do for both of something like team development sessions. It's probably not so appropriate, um, but really it's around that, that career development of individuals as they, as they navigate their way through organisations. Apprenticeships kind of moving on to different roles. Um, and those conversations will look very similar in an organisation as they will um, that we've already spoken around. So whether you're the coach uh, with your coachee and you're looking to, to, to progress that person onto the next role, or whether you're a manager having that conversation, it'll be very similar to what we've shared already around, you know, what, what excites you? Uh, you know, what could be the goal? What, what's the goal today? How, how do these roles sit with that, where you are and what you're doing now? How do you gain that further experience? Um, and how do I help you move to the next stage of your career? So really just exploring what it, what it says about that person, obviously from the profile over to the suggestions. And then, of course, you know, what does that look like for next steps of all the different profiles? Um, um, so I had a coaching conversation on mine and, and mine is I've got executive, but I've also got nonprofit. I've also got um, consulting, people management. And of all of those, which is what I do, you know, there's still my, my motivation across all of the different areas is, is quite different. So what does that look like? You know, really engaging someone around what makes a brilliant day for them and what could be next on their, on their career. Um, some great feedback that we've had already. Um, I cannot tell you on the 10th of February how nervous I was having spent six months buried in Excel spreadsheets um, and we pressed go and the team obviously it wasn't a solo effort I had a huge team behind me um, and with me doing it all but when I pressed go it was like oh, oh my god someone's career and I messed it up um, and it was just brilliant you know um, I think the donkey sanctuary were the first team that came back and said we're already using it within a couple of hours um, it's great um, and, and the feedback has been truly awesome. So I've got top strength of legacy. That's why we've done what we've done, really wanting to make a difference in, um, in helping people have the life that they deserve um, at work and at home. So, you know, and, and it was just nail biting, but within a couple of weeks, that feedback has come through really strongly. So um, do give it a go if you're new to it so far. Um, have the confidence in what we've shared with you around the science. And I'm going to leave you with a couple of pieces around data. Um, and I know some questions are being asked along the way. Uh, as we come off mute at the end, though, uh, feel free as you're sort of diving off um, to, to put more questions in Q&A or, or to come off mute and ask us. Um, but um, so what we've got here at the top is our global norm data. So here you can see the most common seven realised strengths, unrealised strengths, four learned behaviours and three weaknesses across the globe, across those 60,000 profiles, um, across the age group. So that's our global norm. Um, and what I've shared with you underneath is the, is the, the most common um, quadrant for students. Now, I don't have age groups, so that could be between sort of um, 16 uh, plus. So it's not necessarily that they fit into the undergrad uh, program here, uh, but anybody who's, who is a student. Um, and what was really great to see is some, some differences coming out in those realised strengths. So the compassion, equality, unconditionality and humour being uh, much higher for those students versus the global norm. So 
any educators out there thinking, you know, well, what does that look like in terms of, um, you know, how I might work with a student? What does that mean in terms of the strengths that they might need to develop to go into to, to new roles? And how do they play on that more um, in terms of you know, developing next steps within their career? Um, persistence was something that came out for them. They were slightly, slightly weaker um, than... Um, than the, the global norm, but equally that meant that they were more competitive because competitive have uh, has moved away. So um, the student population being more competitive than the global norm. So as I say, slides coming through, you don't need to take notes, but these are, you know, there's already some great learnings that I've been working with students around this area and really helping them think about how, how these strengths can lead them on to the next step. So what we do know from our assessment data is that early talent recruiters, one of the most popular strengths that they're recruiting for is collaboration. So thinking about these kinds of things coming through, and again, we'll be sharing more with you, with you on that um, in the months to come. Um, but you know, how does compassion and conditionality quality help them to be a better collaborator? So starting to use the two sets of data that we can bring to you um, over the next few months to fill those, to, to potentially look at the skills gaps in any students. And the final piece of data, uh, we, we like to think we're the strengths experts here. And, um, and again, some of this makes sense. So what we've got here in terms of some of the um, sectors that we've shared here, not all 43, um, is where a couple of them were really different from uh, the norm data. So banking here, you see personal responsibility and persistence were two very big climbers um, I feel like in the charts here um, and um, across the 60 versus the norm data. So we saw persistence being uh, quite a common weakness in the previous slide, but bankers, oh no, it was something that they had uh, good and strong in their realised strengths. So most of this makes sense. The other piece I wanted to share with you here was the competitive within sales. So of all the data that I looked at, um, then um, the biggest leap within all of the data was that the sales people having competitive as a real life strength. So it's the most common weakness or, or within the top three most common weaknesses within the global norm, but are not for sales. Uh, of course, that makes sense. But it was right up there in terms of um, a realized strength. So it was a huge leap in data, which again is great to see because it makes sense. Um, there were some that kind of were uh, didn't make quite so much sense. Uh, we had to get our heads around, uh, but um, that was uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, so again, some, some great data to share with you. We've got plenty more of that to come. And I know most of us are interested in, uh, in data-led research. So um, watch this space for further webinars on that too.